We're live. Yay! <laughs> we're just going to wait a few minutes for, if you've already joined us, we're going to wait a few minutes for people to arrive. This is both like, um, I don't know, there's like a surreal quality to it. Like I imagine if I were actually giving a demo or a presentation of some kind, it would be like standing in a room with people, you know, slowly filtering <laughs> in and me having to say like awkward hellos to people I haven't met yet. And uh, <laughs> now it's like none of that. I'm just sitting on my couch. But I Right, we can't see people's faces, but we're getting a few folks already. We're just waiting a few minutes for people to filter in. <sighs> You know, I heard it's going to be 25 degrees next week. I heard that too. I know. I'm dreading it because I have to bring all my plants in. Mm. So if you're local, take note. Okay. So we've got some viewers. Should we go ahead and get started? I'm just going to do an intro real quick. Sure. Okay, everyone. Uh, thanks for showing up. Um, welcome to Print Austin's continued online programming for 2021. My name is Kathy Savage, and I'm Print Austin's founder and president. I have our director, Paloma Mioria, helping with tech and fielding questions. Uh, we're very grateful to everyone that has jumped on board with our mostly virtual format this, this year. So thank you for tuning in. There are some in-person events and other virtual programming that you can find on our website since our festival continues until mid-February. There's still plenty happening. Um, so that website is print, printaustin.org. And I also wanted to mention Print Expo, which is this Saturday. Kat's demo tonight will give you a taste of what's, what's going on in our lineup, including panel discussions and other virtual offerings. We have, it's, it's quite a diverse lineup. You can listen to panels, watch demos, attend a workshop, and learn how artists curate prints. There will truly be something for everyone, whether you're an artist, an experienced printmaker, or a collector, or a wannabe collector. Kat is part of that event, and you will be able to see her online booth along with 60 other artists until September, and that's printexpo.org. Um, so I wanted to met, introduce Kat. Kat, we don't know each other very well, but I, I met you through Print Austin a few years ago, and we were at the same studio at Canopy. And I think I happened to walk by your studio when the door was open and I saw your letter press and I was like, oh my gosh, another printmaker. <laughs> um, and then you, you entered the contemporary print that year and you got in, which is not easy to do because we, we get hundreds of applications and it's, it's a very tough. And, and in fact, I think you won an award that year. And I, I am, trying to figure out the dates like 2015 2016 maybe you remember i think it was 2016 but i'm not i'm not sure it was 2016 the first year or the second year right well anyway we're glad that you're here so i'm going to go ahead and disappear for a bit and let you take over thanks so much buddy um, yeah, hi everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. <laughs> um, my name is Kat and I've been making work under the name One Straw Press for a few years now. Um, that print that Kathy just mentioned that was in the contemporary print, that was um, that was like a kind of exciting thing. I, I, I guess I feel a little bit like I've grown up with Print Austin as an event because uh, that was like my first time I was in a gallery show and it sold and it was really exciting. Um, before that, I had really just been um, learning a little bit here and there on my own. So um, I took like a tiny bit of printmaking in college. Um, and then a couple years after college, uh, I was um, just learning how to, uh, I, don't know, I was just like in this transitional state and I um, ended up interning at a place in my hometown. And then um, six months later, I moved down to Austin. And that's when I got my first like sort of side gig doing letterpress printing for Sarah Weimer, um, who's a graphic designer, and she had an outfit called Studio Slow Mo. So learned a ton from Sarah, um, a lot of like really technical printing because she was doing um, like stationery and wedding invitations from these photopolymer plates that are based on um, 
digital design files. So it was like something that you want the every print to look exactly the same and to have this like really high technical quality to it. Um, and then I also, in that space of time, um, ended up interning at Hatch Show Print, which is, I think, the oldest continuously operated letterpress shop in the United States. It's been around for like 140 years or something. You've probably seen their prints somewhere. Um, they make a lot of show posters, especially in Nashville. They're a huge presence. Um, so I just um, little by little became really smitten with letterpress and uh, Eventually, when Sarah decided to stop doing Studio Slow Mo, she offered me the right of first refusal on the press, and I just said, what the heck, and I bought it, and uh, have been kind of making work all along ever since. Um, and I have to say that uh, <laughs> the, uh, the last year has not been super kind to my artistic practice. I think like a lot of people, like 2020 kind of took it out of me, and um, and I've been kind of like struggling a little to, to get back into the studio. But once again, Print Austin came through for me in such a big way because uh, I had just finished this print that I'd been very slowly working on for a couple of years. And then all of the um, all of the like Print Austin PR material started coming out. And I decided like, okay, this is gonna be the thing that, that gets me back in there. And I you know committed to this demo and I applied to Print Expo. And I also have a piece um, that's up at a gallery show in Round Rock right now um, as part of Print Austin. So uh, I just really love this event and um, want to thank Kathy and Paloma for all the work that they do and pulling it together because um, it really has been such a, a great thing um, for me and for so many printmakers in Central Texas. Um, I guess um, before I dive into the demo, I just want to say to my audience, like, you know, my original thought for this evening was that I was going to like play a video of you know, the printing process, and then at the end have like a live Q&A. Um, but I decided to go a little bit of a different route just to hopefully inspire um, more back and forth. So I didn't know who was going to be tuning in. And I thought, you know, if it's an artist, they might want to know more technical information, or if it's just someone who's interested in printmaking, they might need more basics. Um, this is really like, I want this to be a back and forth. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat and uh, Paloma and Kathy will make sure that I see them and I, yeah, I want to be able to answer whatever questions you have. Um, so with that, yeah, uh, Kathy or Paloma, if you want to queue up the, the little slides I have prepared, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, yep. Yeah, so carving and printing relief blocks on a letterpress is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, you can go on to the next slide. Yep. Um, so uh, the first step of the process, of course, is to um, to make a plan or a design for what I'm going to print. Um, if you want to go on to the next slide, um, the print that I'm going to be showing you guys tonight is um, inspired by this quote or really built around this quote. Um, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. Um, this is a quote by Annie Dillard. She's a wonderful writer. Um, this particular piece was a sort of a commission barter situation with a good friend of mine. Um, she wanted a print with this quote on it. And we had a conversation about what it means to her and what it means to me. And uh, I think both of us were sort of circling around some of the same ideas, which is just that like, you know, our daily routines are one kind of cycle and then, you know, the years are a different kind of cycle. And so kind of wanting to build imagery, um, that sort of reflects that kind of like cycle of like the seasons of our lives and just, you know, the actual seasons. Um, so uh, next slide, Kathy. So um, this is, I'm just sharing this as an excerpt from my friend. After we talked, she wrote me this amazing, like almost like stream of consciousness email um, while her you know, two-year-old was supposed to be napping. And it's just sort of like some of the ideas and feelings that she associates with different parts of the year. Um, and I love this. This was like a, an amazing starting off point for me. Um, I, I really love that collaborative aspect of working with clients. I think some artists maybe feel like really hemmed in by it. But for me, it's like often like, oh, great. You know, like other people's ideas give me energy. Um, so uh, in addition to some of the... Um, visuals that she pulls out here. Um, another one that we talked about was including the wren as a central image. Uh, wren is in the type of bird, um, partly because her daughter's name is Willow Wren. And so we wanted to kind of use her daughter um, 
as this symbol or use the bird as a symbol sort of like reflecting like her daughter's growth and, and as a little nudge to Katie to sort of remember like, okay, I need to enjoy these, these every day because this is what builds up and, and um, sort of creates the fabric of our lives together. Um, so um, once we have this sort of ideation process started, then the next step is sketching. Um, do you wanna go on to the next slide, Kathy? Thanks. So as you can see, uh, these are not beautiful sketches. The one on the left is like my very first like rough thumbnail um, with just this like kind of ugly, weird looking mountain. <laughs> and then the one on the right, you know, I've, I've taken it into Photoshop. I used to be really hardcore about only doing things analog, like um, pencil to paper. And um, I have to say that I, I do not regret <laughs> um, adding in some more digital tools to my design process. I think I used to get really fatigued with just iterating and um, now I have no shame about like moving back and forth between using a drawing tablet and using, well, you know, sorry, my dog is like licking herself behind me. Ooh. I'm gonna kick her off. Um, so nowadays I just, I have no shame about using these digital tools um, insofar as they help me to get to a better end solution. Um, so after I've gone back and forth through this for quite a few rounds, um, I ended up with uh, the sketch on the next slide. Um, still a little bit on the rough side, but it definitely tells me what I'm gonna need to carve away to make my relief print. And it kind of gives me a general sense of like what a gradient could look like. I didn't end up going with this particular color scheme, um, but I just wanted something in there to sort of imagine what colors I could use to reflect the seasons. Um, so the next step is carving. And um, when I am carving, if you wanna go to the next slide, Kathy, um, I, these are kind of like my standby tools that I use. Um, I first have to transfer the image onto the block. And so um, I pretty much exclusively use Dick Blick, Battleship Gray, Linoleum. That's my, that's my heartthrob. <laughs> and then the um, Sorol transfer paper is essentially like carbon paper. And so that's the simplest way. There are a lot of like really cool, fancy transfer techniques out there. And I'm happy to go into um, those in more detail. But this is kind of like the tried and true for me. It's just laying the um, the printout or the drawing itself on top of the block, sliding the transfer paper underneath, and then going over it with like a ballpoint pen to transfer the image onto the block. Um, and once I've transferred it, I usually will end up going over the lines also with like a Sharpie or some kind of like more um, yeah, just like a, a more of like a solvent fast um, ink that will survive several cleanings on the press. Um, okay, so you wanna go on to the next slide? Oh, or this is the first video. <laughs> this is like a three woman machine. Um, so this is just a time lapse of me carving this first block. You can see the tools that I use. Um, those are some of them. They're called file, P-F-E-I-L. And they have different um, carving profiles, as you can see, like below. Um, and I'll, I can talk about that a little bit more later. But I start the process by going around all, like just doing the silhouettes of all of the um, different parts of the drawing. And then once I've carved the silhouettes and I've sort of established where the line is, I'll go in with a big scoop and I'll clear away the bigger detail, um, sorry, the bigger areas. And then the last step is to go back in with, um, with some of my smaller tools and get some of the inner details. Um, so I, this part of the process did not actually take that long. I think maybe I carved the whole thing in like an hour or so. And the nice thing about working with linoleum instead of wood is that you don't have to deal with grain. So especially with um, the kinds of like really finicky, tiny details that I like to get, I don't have to go through, um, like I know with a, a lot of people when they're wood carving, they'll use an X-Acto knife and trace out the outside of the line ahead of time to sort of like score the surface of the wood. I don't have to do any of that um, with linoleum. So it's a little bit easier in that way. Um, the next step of this process is typesetting. Uh, I'm not gonna go super deep into typesetting, but I do want y'all to at least know a couple of things. Um, 
<laughs> so I found this like really old, great photograph of women setting type uh, <laughs> that I thought I'd include. I don't think women were usually typesetters. Like I'm pretty sure most of these jobs were for men back in the day, but um, this looks like a really dope print shop to work in. And all of these women are standing in front of drawers that have lots of tiny compartments. And inside each compartment, there's like a different letter or piece of punctuation or piece of spacing material. Um, all of the blocks are like the, the one on the right where whatever is going to print, the letter form or the piece of punctuation is sort of raised above the surface of the block. Um, do you want to click the next, click one more time, Kathy? Yeah, so the key figure here, oh, sorry, go back. <laughs> There's like a piece that I'm highlighting there, thanks. Um, the key figure here is this 0.918 inches. That is what's known as type high. Um, and really the entire press is sort of built around that height. So when you wanna print something on a letter press, you have to make sure that it is 0.918 inches. Definitely can't be taller. If it's shorter, you just have to do some stuff to, um, to bump it up so that it, it's hitting that right height. Um, you can go to the next. Okay. So with the lockup, um, which is the ne next step of the process, um, I do have a video for this that you can go ahead and queue up. Locking something up just makes means like making sure it's secure on the press bed. Um, and I'm using a pica stick here, which is like the letterpress printer's equivalent of a ruler. So uh, I can easily switch back and forth between picas and inches because six picas is an inch. And at this point, I'm just kind of generally eyeballing where I want it to fit on the press bed, knowing how big my shield paper is. Um, I also use that tool called a coin. Um, a coin is an expanding piece of metal. So at the very end, you'll see me use a, what's called a key to um, and insert that into the coin. And then the coin just pushes out and it applies that little extra bit of pressure that you need to make sure that nothing is like wiggling around on the press bed in a way that will give you grief while you're printing. And then furniture is the term for all of these pieces of wood that I'm using um, to, again, just to sort of like shore up the type that's in the middle there and to make sure that nothing um, gets out of whack and that I get like perfect registration and alignment every time. You want it to be snug, but not um, so tight that it's actually like buckling upward and arching. Um, if that's happening, then sometimes the type starts to like wiggle a little out of place. So um, what I was, you'll see me like push on the furniture a little bit and that's just me double checking that the furniture isn't starting to like arch upward. Um, that, and if that were the case, then I would um, take the key and back off a little on the coins just to make it not quite so tight. Um, I'm going to just take a breath for a second to say, if you have any questions, feel free to chime in. I am very happy to derail this part of the demo, um, to talk about what you want to talk about. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and, and keep going for now. Um, so the next step of the process is printing. Um, this is the press that I own. It's called a Vandercook SP15. Kathy, you want to go on to the next slide, please? Um, and this will just go like one at a time. So um, we're naming off some of the really key parts of the press here. <laughs> um, if you click once, we should get the press bed. Um, that's that flat part in the front. Um, Kathy, do you mind clicking again? Yep, perfect. Um, and so the press bed is where the form sits. Form is just like a fancy word for whatever you're printing. Um, the next thing we're pointing out here is, are the ink rollers. The, this press has a really excellent inking system. Um, I would say that if you're like a person who additions in relief prints and you're like kind of on the fence, like come print with this press like one time and you'll be sold. It just like the, the inking part alone makes it worth it in my opinion. Um, anyway, it has a whole system of ink rollers in here and they're all sort of um, rolling both this way and the, the big one on top sort of also vacillates back and forth vacillates, oscillates, oscillates back and forth. Um, so that helps to sort of redist redistribute the ink, say if I'm printing something that has a lot of surface area on one side and not as much on the other. Um, so it really does a ton of the work for me. Um, and then the next thing that we're gonna point out here is the foot treadle down there at the bottom. 
Um, that's the thing that controls the paper grippers, which are up on the top by the cylinder. So you won't really be able to see this in the video that's about to play, but um, each time as I'm getting ready to print, I will slide the piece of paper up on the top and then I'll step on that foot pedal and the foot pedal will raise the grippers and then I'll slide the paper in. And then as I pull my foot off, it'll just chomp down on the paper. And then I crank the paper across because the cylinder has a tight grip on the paper. Um, and that means that um, the grippers are also sort of like the control or the guide that ensures that the paper is hitting at the same place every time. And again, that's just important if you're printing something with multiple colors and you want it to align at a particular pace on the, on the page, the paper grippers are doing some of the work for you. Um, okay, I think we are ready for the next, next video. And this one I'm actually talking in, so yeah. Hmm. Paloma, I can't hear it. Do you mind turning on your volume maybe? Yeah, or you might have to come back. Oh, perfect. The other part of this is that this press has um, essentially like a big steamroll. It has this cylinder um, that grips onto the paper. And then as I crank this baby across, it's applying all of the pressure that pushes the paper onto the form so that it can pick up the ink. Um, I just saw in the chat, well, you're going to have to behave yourself if you're going to be up here. Um, <laughs> I just saw in the chat that um, Matthew Magruder asked a question about getting the block up to type high. Um, so I don't know exactly. It's not quite type high with the linoleum on it, um, but it's really close. So I'm honestly, I'm not sure why they don't just like use blocks that are perfectly type high. That would be very convenient for me. But in any case, I usually end up using um, like two pieces of, um, oh gosh, I'm totally blanking on it. It looks like, it looks like somewhere between cardstock and cardboard, but I'll kind of play around with it. And there are some cheats, like if you have a piece of, um, wooden type available you can like set them side by side and like rub your finger back and forth and feel if they're like hitting at the same height or of course the, the best thing is just to have an actual type high gauge which um where i'm printing my press is at the austin book art center they have those tools available so i'm able to get a really precise reading um but yes to the short answer is no it's not quite type high but it's really close and so it's easy to make up the difference um Okay, let's uh, let's keep moving for now and I'll, I'll loop back to your other question, Matthew, at the end. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is inking. Uh, like I said, this is one of the brilliant things about my press is that it makes the inking process super easy. Um, you wanna go on to the next slide, please? Um, so I don't know that this is common practice among non-letterpress print makers. I mean, printmakers who don't, who are not printing on a letterpress, but uh, like I think almost universally letterpress printers use these Pantone books um, to get the color that they want. And um, will you click one time, Kathy? I'm highlighting here this little piece. So the amazing thing, oh, go back. Um, the amazing thing about the, um, I'm so sorry, I got this thing and uh, my messages are on and I 
thought I had quit. Anyway, um, just gonna keep going. So the amazing thing about the Pantone book is that it gives you this little formula um, that will let you print any color that you want to, <laughs> essentially. Um, I have to say, I don't, I'm not the kind of person who gets out a little scale and like weighs out the different amounts of each ink, but I think um, for the work that I'm doing, it's usually good enough to get like in the ballpark. And then when I'm actually putting something on press, then I can make those little micro adjustments if a client has asked for a specific color. Um, so we can go on to the next video now. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, so you can see I'm referencing my Pantone book here and I'm just pulling out like all of the constituent colors for each of the three colors that I'm gonna mix. I'm making a gradient for this next pass through the press. Um, and it's sort of like a, sort of like a primary uh, color gradient <laughs> happening here. So there's the blue and the yellow and then this peachy color. Um, the final print doesn't end up looking like it's primary colors, but that's the way it started at least. And then, um, like I said, throwing it up on press is um, really no fuss at all. I just put, you know, one color in my gradient here, the next color in the middle, the third color on the other end. And then um, once you turn the, the, type, the press on and you engage the rollers, that top one moving back and forth does all the work to make the gradient for me. Um, so it doesn't give you as much control over the colors as if you were um, hand rolling and, and, and layering the ink on yourself, but it's pretty good. And I've definitely seen like at Hatch, um, I remember somebody was able to do like a full rainbow by just like really aggressively re-inking and you know, making sure that each of the colors didn't get too mixed together and, and muddied up. Um, I pulled a first proof. I saw some things that I wanted to change about it, including the gradient. I'm doing, <laughs> this is probably poor form carving on the press bed, but sometimes I do that with my own press. Um, and then I go back in and after I've made my edits, I probably made a few more edits. Honestly, I cut I cut a lot of the um, make ready process out of these videos because it wasn't super interesting to watch, but there is a lot of sort of back and forth as I'm printing. Uh, or as I'm proofing to make sure I'm I'm getting um, getting something good, especially because um, with this particular type of lino cut, you know, if you've messed up the first layer, then the second layer isn't you know is where you often really start to notice. Oh shoot! I wish I had carved that away, or I wish I had gotten those colors a little bit different. Um, Okay, and so then I've carved into the block once, but I am doing a reduction cut this time, which means I'm carving back into it again. Um, uh, next slide, please. So this is the simplest um, explanation for a reduction cut I ever heard. I don't remember where I got it from, so I'm sorry for not giving credit, but essentially it says, if you wanna do a print of a smiley face and it's a reduction cut, you would just print a yellow circle first and then after printing the yellow circle, you would carve away everything except for the eyes and the mouth. So all of that gray area around the eyes and the mouth is like the material that you've removed and you're just left with those pieces. Um, and the idea is that, you know, you obviously you've reduced the surface area. That's why they're calling it a reduction cut. Um, but also it has, um, it has sort of this financial advantage, one, I guess you could say, of now you can say, oh, this is a limited edition print because I've destroyed the, pro the block in the process of making the print. I can charge a little bit more for it because this particular smiley face print can never be produced again in the exact same form. <laughs> um, so anyway, all to say, I'm about to go back and carve into my block again. If you wanna um, go ahead and play the next video, please. So um, for this one, I'm almost exclusively using my teeny tiny um, carving tools because this is the layer where I go in and I carve out all of the details. It's sort of like a key block if you're familiar with that term. Um, whereas the, the first one was like just these rough outlines. Now I'm going back in and adding um, all of the, the little sort of nitty gritty details that will make the image come to life. And um, I think of this as being a little bit different than painting. So um, 
I remember in my high school painting class, my teacher would get mad at us for using the teeniest, tiniest brushes. And she would say, you have to use the, the largest brush that you possibly can. And um, I kind of think that for printmaking, it can be um, it can be beneficial to use the smaller carving tool because you leave behind a little bit more of the, the texture. And with printmaking, it really is about the mark of the human hand, at least, of course, not everybody prints that way, but I think a lot of Western printmakers kind of fall into that tradition. Um, and so, yeah, I will sometimes use, um, like I did with the bird feathers at the beginning, use a smaller carving tool than I absolutely need to so that I can get a little bit of that extra texture in there. Um, and this one, I, yeah, I specifically remember that, like, this is usually the part of the process where I do have to carve like multiple times. So um, in a minute, I'll, I finish carving and you can see me, I throw it back on press. Well, the truth is it went on press and then it came right back off press because I wasn't totally happy with that first print. Um, you can see I'm making a, a couple edits right there. One thing that, that almost always happens is that, um, is that like you get a little bit of noise outside of the, the illustration area. So even like parts that weren't printing at all on the um, first pass through, just because you've reduced the amount of surface area and the rollers can now push down a little bit harder on the block as a whole, you end up like picking up some noise. So you have to go back through and, and clean it up. Um, and then, yeah, I guess we kind of jumped through that, but um, basically I just ran through the last print run and then I cleaned the press. To clean my press, I use um, vegetable oil first. I mix that in, like directly into the ink while the press is like still running. So it all circ circulates through and then that gets rid of like 90% of the pigment. And then you spend like another like 10 minutes like wiping away the last like 10% with California wash solvent. Um, and that is the final print. Um, Hopefully Annie Dillard would be <laughs> repleased and not too upset that I borrowed her quote for this print. Um, so uh, I'm finished with my part of the presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I guess I can start with the question that Matt Matthew asked earlier, um, which is price, a pricing question. This is an interesting one for me because for a long time I have suffered from real imposter syndrome and uh, <laughs> I, I would charge for all of the mechanical, how do I say this? I would charge for the printing, but I usually wouldn't charge for the design. And um, I had a couple different metrics. Um, I'm, you know, honestly, I've been <laughs> I've been a little bit out of the loop with commission work because I was in grad school and um, this has been my first year back. So I can't even remember off the top of my head what the um, what the different prices that I use are. But if you want to send me an email or a, a Instagram message or something like that later, I'm happy to give you more information because I know that's the kind of thing that's like really impossible to do um, without having a sense of how other people price their work. Um, I guess I should also say <laughs> that uh, if you are super stoked on this process and you live in the Austin area, the um, Austin Book Art Center has letterpress classes. Um, not right now because of the pandemic. They're just doing virtual book arts classes at the moment. Um, but I imagine that once the vaccinations are circulating more regular re readily, um, they're going to get the letterpress classes back on the schedule. And that's a really great place to take classes. And that's where my press is. So. Um, you can uh, print on the very press that you saw tonight if you so desired. Oh, thank you for throwing that in the chat, Print Austin. Um, okay, so Neil asked a couple of questions about planning a multi-layer print. Um, there is absolutely a way to do this if um, you want to preserve each layer. Uh, I, okay, so I think that the way that, that you're like, I've seen, okay, so the person that I've seen do this recently who had like a really great video of it, and you could probably go find it, is Laura Baisden of Camp Never Nice. Um, that her Instagram handle is Camp Never Nice. And she posted a video that showed how she will use, um, 
like she will she will carve the key block first, which again is the one that sort of contains the most uh, important information about the illustration, sort of all the outlines and all of that. So she'll print the key block first onto a, a sheet of paper, just in like a heavy black ink. And then she'll run and then she'll put like the next block that's cut to the exact same size in the press bed. And then she'll run that same sheet of paper that has the print from the key block on it onto the block that's sitting in the press bed. And so then she'll get this like really perfect transfer. Um, of course, you could just make the same drawing and um, use the same process that I used with carbon paper to transfer the image. And that Honestly, it works fine if you're not doing something that's super detailed. If you're just like, oh, I, you know, I want there to be a big red circle in this section. Um, you don't, you don't need to do any kind of like fancy registration process. But that's like a really good technical one, um, and you could go find that. And then in terms of how you plan um, a multi-layer print. Um, I think like that part has definitely gotten easier for me now that I am working in applications like Photoshop and Procreate because you can literally separate the, um, you know, the, the black line drawing from this like, you know, sketchy gradient draw layer underneath. Like they're just, they're completely separate layers in the application. Um, I've honestly I've never thought about how do I plan <laughs> plan it. It is really tricky. Like if you um, if you're familiar at all with the the house postcard prints that I did, um, that's the sort of image that's featured in like the Print Expo Expo um, guide for me. And those were extremely tricky because I was only doing two colors and in a really small space, and I wanted a lot of detail. And so in that case, I had to be really mindful going into the process of like, okay, if I'm not using, um, if I, if I am not going to have an outline here, then how, what other ways, like what kind of textures can I use to sort of define these separate spaces and make it like a really clear and readable image? Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I tried. <laughs> um, did you print the type using the letterpress as well? Yes. I'm curious as to how you register the paper so that the text goes right in the center of your print. Um, so that very, well, I guess it wasn't the first video. The second video about the lockup, um, that's the one where I'm locking up the type on press. And so, yes, I used movable type to print the quote on this one. And essentially, um, this print was like really easy because I was using a sheet of paper that was 12 inches wide and the press itself only accommodates about 14 inches wide. So I know that as long as I have the paper sort of like roughly centered and I have the type roughly centered on the press bed, then um, my registration from side to side is already done for me. Um, and I can, I didn't really go into this in the video, but there's like a small um, uh, thing on the top of the press where you can unscrew this dial and like move the guide from side to side. And that helps you make those sort of like micro adjustments. So if you can get it within an inch or two, then you can usually like do the rest of the work up here and not have to continually like unlock the coins and move the furniture around. Um, so it's nice to get it in the ballpark. Um, the the top to bottom measurement was like a little bit trickier, but I sort of know roughly where the printable area starts in my press bed. And then I just know like, okay, again, I'm I'm printing a sheet of paper that's, I mean, it was, it was 12 by 12 and a half inches. So I'm going, you know, sort of like, okay, I want like a six and an eighth is where I want the center of the type to hit. And so I just measured that out with a pica, uh, pica stick first, and then I filled in with furniture. Um, I can't remember if I answered this or if I mentioned this during the video, but the furniture all comes in these standardized standardized sizes. So it's really nice um, once you're printing, you know, if you pull a proof and you say, oh, this needs to move half an inch to the left, um, you already know that half an inch equals three picas and you have a three pica piece set on the right side. And so you just have to flip it over to the other side to get it to make that perfect adjustment. Um, other questions? Oh, hi, Ben. Oh my gosh, I forgot to give a shout out to Ben. I meant to. Um, ben Sargent 
is uh, the very gracious human being who has lent me his type for years for my various projects. And he's taught me a ton. It's actually a little bit <laughs> absurd that he's here asking me questions because he's been printing so long. But um, but it's true that we have different kinds of presses. So it looks like he's asking me a Vander Cook question. Um, so he says, clearly, absolutely accurate register is important on a piece like this. How does the register work on the Vander Cook? Um, I did explain a little bit of that with Paloma just now um, in terms of like getting it set up on the press bed and using the guide at the top to sort of like help you with those micro adjustments. Um, the, the registration on this was actually not as tricky as you would think because that is the great advantage of the reduction cut. Um, I never had to pack away the furniture and then reset up the block on press. Um, so I was just, I basically like printed that first layer of the linoleum block and then took it off the press bed, did more carving and then put it back on in the exact same place. And I automatically know that it's going to be perfectly registered or perfectly aligned. Um, so that's one of the reasons that I like working with a reduction cut is because it saved me some time on the um, registration. These are great questions, you guys. Also, thank you for the for the kind comments. It's nice to see some familiar names. Hi, Rebecca, and hi, Lindsay. Ooh, Paloma is asking if I have any projects coming up. Um, yeah, so... Uh, I'm actually very excited <laughs> about a particular project um, that's kind of in the works. And I don't want to say too much about it because I haven't even really started um, fully sketching out my ideas yet. But um, I will say that like I had previously done those um, those postcards of different the different neighborhoods in Austin. And I think that those in some way were like a little bit of a meditation for me on different types of home. And this is going to be a little bit more of an abstracted version of that project. Um, but I've been reading rereading re um, Art and Fear, um, which is a book that I periodically will pick up and reread little parts of. And he says this thing um, kind of close to the beginning about how like only the artist knows like what part of their process they really need to work on and improve. And for me, I know that something that I often fail to do is like if I'm going to do a whole series, I don't always do a good job of sort of like thinking about what's going to make the series cohesive or work together from the outset. And so my big challenge for myself for this next project is that I know it's going to be a big series, or maybe not huge, but you know, at least probably like seven or eight prints is what I'm planning right now. And I wanna um, make sure I do all of the planning for all of them ahead of time so that I can get that really cohesive look. So that's my personal challenge and the next project that I have coming up. Um, I think Kathy asked, where did you get your Vandercook and how hard are they to find? Um, I purchased my Vandercook from uh, Sarah Weimer, who was the woman that I'd printed for before when she decided she was fed up with print <laughs> letterpress printing, which is fair. Um, it's sometimes a very tedious and frustrating process. But anyway, she decided to get out of the business and she just offered me dibs on her press. And so I bought it directly from her, um, which was nice because I had already been printing with it for years at that point and knew most of its quirks. Um, so yeah, it was just too good to pass up. Um, I would say the Vandercook, I mean, I obviously haven't been looking for another Vandercook. They are a little bit harder to find for um, compared to some of the other types of letter presses. Like I think if you want um, sort of like a the clamshell style platen press, those are a little bit easier to come by and they're a little bit cheaper. Um, I think they're a little bit more intimidating to some people because you have to stick your hand inside this <laughs> this big cast iron machine, you know, and people lose fingers and, you know, accidents happen. Um, it's really hard to injure yourself on a vendor cook. I've done it, but like <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. Um, and they're also really nice for a lot of um, people who want to print posters because 
Um, it's another big advantage of the Vandercook versus the Platin Press. Like if you think about the Platin Press, it's making the impact all at once. Like the entire print is happening at this moment and all of the pressure that can be pressed is pressing at this moment. Um, so sometimes it's really hard to get like a full bleed background or a really rich color. Whereas with the Vandercook, the cylinder is rolling over and only one tiny strip of the cylinder is really making um, contact with the form at any given time. And so that means that the entire pressure of the um, cylinder is really concentrated on the part of the print that's printing right now. And so you can get really good, consistent, even pressure across um, kind of a bigger print area. Um, so I think, anyway, that's a little bit of a digression, but all to say that they are a little bit more popular um, for people who are just getting into letterpress and they're great presses, to be honest. Um, so they, you can find them. And if you're looking for one, you should go to briarpress.org, B-R-I-A-R. -R. Um, you probably already find that, found that <laughs> website if you've been Googling letterpress stuff, um, but they usually have some listings on there. And I would say like a Vandercook is like standard around 10K to buy. Um, that doesn't cover the transpo costs. So, um, Matthew asked, how much overage do you print for a job? Wow. I hate feeling like getting to the end of a press run and like, like counting out <laughs> the number of prints and like, like quaking in fear that I won't have enough to fulfill a client order. Um, especially if it was something that was like a reduction cut. I don't, I don't usually do reduction cut reduction cuts for client jobs because it's just too risky. But um, yeah, so I'll usually go like way over. I think like it's pretty normal to do like 10% or 20% extra, but I, um, yeah, I'll, I'll go, I'll go way more than that. Paper's not that expensive. So <laughs> I, I'll, do, I'll do like 1.5 sometimes. Um, Oh, a uh, question from Marianne. Marianne asked, what's the origin of the name One Star Press? Um, when I was uh, younger, before before I had ever been on a letterpress, I, um, I was in Japan and I was doing kind of a research project about organic farming in Japan. And part of that led me to read this book, um, it's a very wonderful book by Masanobu Fukuoka. It's like one part Zen Buddhism, one part agriculture. It's like this mixture between very practical information, very philosophical information. Um, and I just like really loved that book at the time. And I felt like um, I had maybe like a similar relationship to letterpress in that, you know, it um, it's a craft and it, it feels very mechanical and practical and inky and oily sometimes, but it also has this um, kind of like other, um, I don't know, just like psychology to it. Like it's so slow moving and tedious sometimes, but I really take a lot of joy in um, the slowness of the process. So I think, yeah, I just decided to name uh, my press after Masanobu Fukuoka's One Straw Revolution. Oh, thanks, Ben. That's a nice comment. Um, I'm not familiar with Ted Orland. I'll have to I'll have to check that out. Um, Noni, oh hi Noni. Noni asks, how long does it usually take you to finish a project of this scale? Um, I would say um, this project I whipped out pretty quickly because I had a deadline coming up. Um, as in I think Katie and I talked on Monday and then I, I finished the sketches on like Wednesday <laughs> and I started carving on Friday and then I had printed the whole thing by Sunday. So it was a really, really short timeline for this one. And that's not typical. It was because I knew I needed to get, um, a printing process recorded for this demo. I would say normally when I know there's gonna be a little bit more back and forth, like this project, it was like, I was working with a friend. I knew she was gonna be, you know, pretty relaxed about what the ultimate design was. And so um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a lot of back and forth between me and her. We just had these like couple of conversations and then I showed her sketches and she said, looks great. Um, normally when there is that back and forth, I would say that 
I don't take on a project that's, you know, less than two months out. And I would say like, especially right now, because um, I guess a little bit of backstory about me um, is that before I went to grad school for graphic design, I was working as a teacher. <laughs> and so like coming home and like carving a linoleum block was like exactly the creative release that I needed at the end of the day. Now I have this great job where I get to make things um, and be creative all day, which is a, a joy. But it means that sometimes I uh, don't have quite as much energy in the evenings for these creative projects. So I think, yeah, I would probably give myself like at least two months, but really um, longer if we're talking about a project where I'm expecting there to be um, quite a bit of back and forth with the client. But as you saw, like that whole carving and printing process happened in the course of a weekend. So once the plan is in place, like the execution can happen relatively quickly for letterpress. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to FedEx and making copies, but it's still pretty quick. Oh my gosh, art and fear. Yes, I was referencing that. Sorry, I'm just reading reading Matt's comments here. Um, yes, that is, a, that is the author and I had just completely blanked on his name. Um, agreed, it is a wonderful book and definitely recommend. <laughs> um, well, if and hello everyone, I don't think I've come on the screen quite yet, but I'm Panama. I'm the director of Print Austin, and um, for those of us or those of y'all who are just joining, um, this is also Kathy, the founder and president of Print Austin. Um, and if there are no more questions, we can we can close out and and do and share some links as well. Um, so first of all, thank you, Kat, so much for um, for doing this. It was such a cool way of doing a workshop. We really enjoyed like the videos, and and we had some people commenting on how they really liked the format as well, um, with like the videos going and then you explaining. Um, so thank you so much for setting this up. This has been so informative and so very cool. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It is. Um, I mean, it was, it was like stressful to plan this as a remote thing or a virtual thing, but it, usually if someone's coming to the studio, it's impossible to show them the whole process in just a short space of time. So kind of an advantage of the, the virtual format. But yeah, thank you. Thank you guys so much for all the work that you do in putting this together. It is not unappreciated. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, for everyone who is joining us, thank you for tuning in tonight. Um, and if you're interested in some of uh, Kat's work. I will drop her um, a link to her Instagram and to her Etsy page where she has um, some really great uh, prints, including, and I'm going to pull out and brag a little bit. Um, this was the, like, I think the, the first or second print that I bought from you. And this is um, part of the, the postcards, the Austin neighborhoods that she did. And this one's um, from the Montopolis neighborhood, I believe. Yes. Yep. Um, which was so cool. And I just wanted to say that I really appreciated this print because that's kind of where in the Montopolis neighborhood at Coronado Studio is where I got my introduction into all things printmaking. Oh, so cool. uh, so this is a particularly special print for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can actually find some of those prints still on her Etsy page. Um, and in addition to that, uh, Kat is going to be uh, part of our print expo, as Kathy mentioned at the beginning, uh, which is happening this Saturday, February 6th. And uh, Print Expo this year, for all of y'all who have joined us in the past, which was a really amazing uh, in-person print fair, this year it's all going to be online. And we have um, some, like all of the artists, which I think we have about 60 or a little bit more artists participating this year. Their vendor profile will be going live on Saturday, and you can explore more of their work and purchase some of their work as well. Um, and Kat will be on there. Um, and. Another really great thing is that we've partnered with Almost Real Things to um, to produce our print expo guide, and it has some really great um, images of artwork. And I can probably pull up Kat's page. Let's see, it's a lot of work in here. Here it is. Um, those are the postcards. I I yes, those are the postcards. So um, anyway, this is really great. Um, 
little publication that we're actually giving away for free. Um, all you have to do is pay for shipping. Um, so if you go to printexpo.org uh, slash shop, you will be able to find and order your copy. Um, and just want to do, again, a quick shout out to Almost Real Things for partnering with us on this, as well as uh, Carlos Hernandez of Burning Bones Press, who did the amazing uh, artwork that you see on the cover. And thanks also to all of our artists in here. Um, and then the last thing is that for Print Expo, we're having our, um, which is new this year, we're having an, a one day, all day conference um, where we're going to be having workshops like the one that uh, that Kat just presented, as well as some panels and uh, artist talks. So we're really excited about that. And that begins at 10 a.m. And you can register for that at printexpo.org so that we can send you the direct link to um, to the, uh, the Print Expo conference. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to say, Kathy? Oh, just that it's free to attend. The yes. You may have said that. Uh, I don't think that I did. So yes, it is free to attend. Um, all you have to do is register to get the link um, and then you can join us for amazing programming all day Saturday. Um, and the schedule is up on the website, so uh, check it out. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to close out with, Kat? No, just, uh, yeah, thank you so much to everyone for tuning in. This, uh, this was a lot of fun and I loved all the questions. Awesome. Cool, thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Bye.